Wonderful. Welcome everyone to Ovarian Cancer Canada's speaker series, Writing Through Cancer, How Writing Can Be Healing. My name is Marianne Paulus. I'm the Programs Associate with Ovarian Cancer Canada, and it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight as your host. To start us off, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous people of all the lands that we are on today. While we are gathering virtually, let's take a moment to appreciate the importance of the lands we each call home and to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations, as well as our own understanding of Indigenous peoples and their cultures. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to our speaker for this evening, Sharon Bray. Sharon is best known for her innovative work with transformative writing. Since her experience with cancer and subsequent heart failure several years ago, she has specialized in leading therapeutic writing groups for cancer patients, survivors, and many others. Sharon earned a Bachelor of Arts and completed an additional graduate year of teacher training certification at San Jose State University in California, hmm. obtained her master's from Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, and her doctorate in educational psychology from the University of Toronto. Sharon later studied creative and transformative writing through the University of Washington, Humber School for Writers, and Goddard College. Sharon has written two books, led many expressive writing workshops, and co-edited a cancer patient's anthology. It's my pleasure to hand over tonight's presentation to Sharon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Marianne, and I'm delighted to be here a second time. Uh, I think we did this about a year ago, and I've gotten better at my slides and screen sharing, but welcome, everybody. I'm going to give you a little short uh, explanation of how writing can be healing and particularly drawing from my experience working with cancer patients. So let me go to the first slide. Writing has helped me heal. Writing has changed my life. Writing has saved my life. This is a quote from a book called Writing is a Way of Healing by Louise DeSalvo. She's an English professor who also, like all of us, experienced some difficult and traumatic times during her lifetime. She has always written, but she got interested in the research, which was fairly new about 30 some odd years ago, on something called expressive writing. And the researchers, we're really trying to understand, can writing be healing? And this was her opening line in her book, a powerful one. And so tonight we wanna to talk about how writing can be healing, how it can help us gain insight, how it can save our lives metaphorically, okay? Now, not all kinds of writing is healing. Um, there's a particular kind, and this is called expressive writing, which was named by the psychologist who initiated the research well over 30 years ago, a lovely, generous man named James Pennebaker. He's written extensively about ex expressive writing, and he and his colleagues together have really put it on the map, so to speak, as a way that can really be helpful to people when you're going through difficult and traumatic times. What is expressive writing? Here's the definition. It's writing about thoughts and feelings related to a stressful or traumatic life experience without concern for style, spelling, punctuation, or grammar. For those of us who didn't have a great time in high school English composition, this is really freeing. But this is the definition of the kind of writing that is healing. So let's find out a little bit more about it. How is it healing? Well, many, many research studies have been done with cancer patients, with cardiac patients, with people with arthritis, with war veterans uh, returning from Afghanistan and Vietnam with children um, and a host of others. And these are some of the key benefits, perhaps the most frequently cited benefits in the research. They found that expressive writing, number one, improved the quality of life 
among the people who participated in the research studies. In some cases, like Epstein-Barr virus, it improved immune system functioning. And for many people, better quality of sleep, even with cancer patients, fewer doctor visits, and overall improved mental as well as physical health. Pretty powerful stuff for writing. There are other benefits of writing. When we are ill, stressed, suffering from trauma or hardship, we often lose our voices. It's, it's hard to express ourselves, hard to get understanding to others and ourselves. So what does writing help us do? Other benefits? It translates those chaotic feelings that we feel in those times into words. It connects what you're feeling with the things that caused it. It's not always apparent when we're upset, why we're upset. Expressive writing can help you make those connections. It helps you discover greater self-understanding and insight, more reflection, and reflection we know is what helps us grow emotionally and intellectually. And as I said before, it helps you reclaim your voice. I just got the chat room up there. Sorry, I seem to be getting, there we go. So before I go much further, I want to have you experience a writing exercise. Now, all of expressive writing workshops that I do, the writing exercises are timed, and there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But generally, here's what you want to do. I'm going to give you a prompt. You're going to start writing immediately. This is going to be a very short exercise, only five minutes. Write quickly write freely. Keep your fingers or your pens moving. Don't stop to edit or reread or review or worry about spelling and grammar. Forget about it. Just keep writing. When you hear the chime, and here's an example of it, then stop. Once you've heard that, stop and read over what you've written. If there are any surprises or things that st stand out, underline. Okay, so here's our prompt. I want you for the next five minutes to write about the moment you first heard the words, you have cancer. Or if you're a caregiver, the first time you heard those words, your daughter, your son, your husband, or whomever has cancer. How did it feel? Where were you? Was it on the phone? Was it in the doctor's office? What do you remember about that? What do you remember that was said? What do you remember how it felt? Are you ready? Go ahead.
and start to bring it to a close. I don't know if you're able to hear this on video, but there's a reason I use this particular little chime. It has the longest sustained chime of any I've found. And so the little secret is when I ring that chime, you have about 30 extra seconds. Okay, now that you've written, what I'd like you to do is take a couple of minutes to read and reflect about what it was like to write under time pressure. Read over what you wrote. Were you surprised at what came up or how much came up? Or maybe you got stalled, but were you surprised in any way? And underline any phrases or words that seem to have more emotional power that stand out for you. I'll just give you a minute or two to do that. It's important to read and reflect once you've written and to underline those phrases. They usually are way doors in, you might say, open doors to going deeper in your writing. And that's an important aspect of expressive writing. So for the next couple of minutes, would anyone like to read out loud what they have written? If you would, if you would raise your hand and Marianne will. Make sure that you did, Linda. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Go ahead. Just read. Right. You don't okay. have to explain right. anything. Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, July 2019, frozen in time, hot and cold. Couldn't hear anything else. Didn't want to believe it. But in my heart, I knew it was cancer. Maybe I didn't respect cancer when it was mild because I had a mild form of skin cancer. I needed a warning, and that was a word I underlined, to change my thoughts, my work, my attitude, my spiritual practice, which I thought wasn't as spiritual as I thought it was. Uh, I was well, you know, working for my the convenience of, of myself rather than the convenience of others and what was best for other people. I had to change, but I also had to fight and win. I couldn't play out my parents' death at age 66. I was 66 when I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Defeat karma, disappointed in myself. Wow, that last line, disappointed in myself. There's always one line that whether it's the line you choose or the line that the listener, if you're reading out loud, finds, whoa, go further with that. That was great, Linda, and courageous, too, to be the very first one to read. Thank you. Thank you. Would someone else like to read? Starla? Unmute yourself. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Or can you hear me? A little louder. You'll have to talk a little louder. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep. Is that better? Yep. Okay, I have. I was sitting in a room at the Alan Blair Cancer Center. I was awaiting biopsy results. My mom was there and my son Bodhi too. When we first walked into the room, there was a social worker there. The second I saw her, I began sobbing. I knew it was back before the words even left my doctor's mouth. I felt sick to my stomach. What was I going to do? My baby, what happens if I die? Fuck, I can't do this again. I stopped crying and I avoided the social worker's eyes. I looked at my oncologist and I asked him, what's the plan? What are we going to do? We locked eyes for a long time. And then he looked down at my son. He was still just a baby. We fight, he said. Beautiful. And so much Starla got written in that short period of time and expressed the cue from walking in and seeing the social worker stands out for me. What that must have done to you and you talked about, you knew it was bad. 
Thank you so much for sharing what you've written. Thank you. And we'll take one more and then we'll move on. Anyone else? I see people have raised their hand. Hi there. Hi. Um, Eileen? Uh, or... Lena. 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 Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I was told early at 6 a.m. in the morning after surgery, after my husband had said that they found something the night before. So I was on my own in bed and it was dark. She woke me up to tell me I felt disconnected and couldn't really take it in. No shock or fear. It was as if it didn't quite relate to me. <clears throat> and the same thing when the surgeon came in, I heard the words, but I don't think I reacted. The main fear in my gut was when the possibility had been raised beforehand at prior appointments. The certainty only confirmed it, but I don't think I felt anything. I was more concerned with my immediate pain from the surgery. Huh. The immediate pain and how I felt after surgery was all I could hold in my mind, not the cancer diagnosis. Thanks. Being awakened in the dark on your own and told, that gave me chills, Eileen. I know. It gave yeah. me chills. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thanks. Okay, I know that some there'll be more of you who might like to read, and you'll have another chance a little later on. But thank you to those who did. Um, I have to congratulate you because sometimes it takes pulling a little teeth as a group leader to get someone to read first. So how did it feel to write under time pressure? That's one of the most interesting things. And there's a reason that timed writing is more healing than just free writing. And I'll get to that a little bit later on. But go back to the things that you've underlined. When you write again, use one of those phrases or words as your own prompt to get you started. Because as I said before, these are usually doors in to even more important emotions and aspects of your experience. Okay, so let's go on. What is the most healing kind of writing? I use this picture of an iceberg because if we could see a cross section of an iceberg, we imagine it's like this, it's a phony picture. But if you're on the water and you're moving toward it, it looks pretty massive. But the real size, the real part of it, the amazing size of it is beneath the waterline. Years ago, I taught memoir to adults in California. And I had a fellow come in who said he wanted to write a memoir about his father, about how his father built these, had a passion for building model sailing ships and that experience. And so he began to write and read some of his writing out loud. And frankly, his writing wasn't engaging very many people. It's kind of boring to hear about these model ships time after time. And then one night, some anger showed up in the writing. And so we probed that a little, just a little. And what was the real story? It wasn't the sailing ships. It wasn't the models. The real story is here's a man who suffered real pain for the lack of attention from his father, who never gave him much time or interest all during his childhood. So consuming was his hobby. And so for writing that is most healing, I often say to people in my writing groups, writing is courageous act. And the reason it is, is you have to dive deep beneath the waterline. And how do you do that? Well, it helps to imagine you're writing to a very close friend, a close confidant. But healing writing is also, the most healing writing, is also writing that uses detail and description. I used to teach creative writing at UCLA. That's the thing we look for in creative writing. Very often I'd say to my students, show me, show me, show me. Don't just tell me, 
Make me feel it. Make me see it. How do you do that? With detail and description, dialogue. Those things are important. And you work to make connections between what happened and what you feel. Those connections really lead to greater insight and self-understanding. And finally, and very importantly, the most healing kind of writing is when you create a story from your experience. And so the story arc is a beginning, a middle, a climax, and an end. It's the same thing when you were kids growing up, when you'd hear those being read to by your parents. Once upon a time, that's the beginning, and you're primed for it. And then something happens, the characters are introduced, and then a climax comes, and then things are resolved. But story is uniquely important to us all. And so story is very much a part of writing that is most healing. Why? I love this quote from Leslie Marmon Silko. She's an indigenous American writer. And in her book, Ceremony, she had this wonderful uh, quote. And she said, let me tell you something about stories. They aren't just entertainment. They are all we have to fight off illness and death. You don't have anything if you don't have your stories. Think about it. Stories are the way we have communicated as human beings since we got language. They're the way that we made sense of the world, sense of our feelings, the way we imparted history, the way we were remembered through our stories. Stories are deeply important to us as people, but they are also very important in writing that is most healing. So let's try another little writing exercise. This time, I'm going to let you decide what prompt you would like to choose. So these are just a sampling of some of the prompts that I will often use in an expressive writing cancer group. So for example, you just you might want to go further with when the doctor said cancer. You might write about what keeps you awake at night. What would you change if you could? Today, I feel like dot, 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 fill in the blank. Something that makes me angry is dot, dot, dot. What gives you hope? Write about, I can't, I've got this thing in front of my thing. <laughs> there, write about your changed body, the altered body. Write a letter, cancer, talk back to cancer. And I just went ahead. Uh, can you back me up by any chance, Mary? <laughs> I can't, Sharon, but if you hit your, at the back, um, the arrow that points to the left on your screen, that should be able to take you back to your left. The arrow that points to the left on my screen. Or on your keyboard, sorry. On my keyboard. Okay. You know what? I'm going to, but I've got a copy of the handouts here. I'm sorry, folks. I got a little enthusiastic. Okay, here we go. I'll finish the list and then I'll say them again since you are now without uh, the visual. Uh, what gives you hope? Write about the altered body. Write a letter to cancer. What do you fear most? What are you grateful for? How would you like to be remembered? So let me say those again and just choose one that you would like to write about. And then I'm going to give you another five minutes. When the doctor said cancer, what keeps you awake at night? What would you change if you could? Today, I feel like, finish the thought, something that makes me angry is, and finish the thought, what gives you hope? Write about your changed body. Write a letter to cancer. What do you fear the most? What are you grateful for? And how would you like to be remembered? Okay, take one of those. And for the next five minutes, again, start writing. Go ahead. And if you want to see the prompts, they are in the chat as well. 
Thank you. and start to bring it to a close.
Okay. So again, read over what you've written. Were you surprised in any way? Underline any phrases, any words, anything that stands out that seems to hold more power. Those are the, the ones that later on you might explore more deeply. And again, let's have a couple of participants share, if you're willing, what you have written. That's great. I saw Beatrice's hand come up. Beatrice, yeah, I might go have right ahead. An echo because I'm using you. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Beatrice, you've got a terrible echo, and we I can't know. understand. We can't understand you. Okay, can I do next time? I'm just gonna fix my computer. Okay, all right. Okay. I saw April. Can you hear me? April, have you raised your hand? I did. Can you hear me? A uh, little bit louder, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I wrote a letter to cancer. Well, Cancer, it's me. I normally start a letter with dear, but you are not dear to me. I can't believe we know each other so intimately now. I was always telling anyone who listened I was never getting cancer. No, not me. I supported cancer fundraisers and peers who had been involved with cancer. You were something I was well aware of, uh, but wanted nothing. I was well aware of you, but wanted nothing to do with you. But here we are. I knew you were not a mighty force to be reckoned with. I just didn't know how um, how forceful until I had to deal with you on a daily basis. You came to win. I just can't let you win. It isn't always easy to be in the club in a club you didn't sign up for. But I will be leaving the club. I can certainly have a lot of um, respect for you, your might, but also know that it's time for me to leave this club. And that, yes, that I can be managed. I can be unmanaged by you. There's some great lines in here. I can't let you win. And the club you didn't sign up to join, the club that you didn't sign up for. But the beginning to April, dear cancer, you're not dear to me. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for reading. Someone else? We'll invite Marion. Marion? Marion disappeared on me there. Is she there? Okay. Well. I see Lisa. Uh, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so I just read about what I was grateful for, sort of. Okay. <laughs> um, so it goes like this. So I view the world differently and the experiences of people around me and beyond. So I am an observer of people and their connectedness to each other and to the environment in which they're in. I felt as though my experiences in both these areas have heightened since my cancer diagnosis. I look at people with a greater appreciation and admiration for them as individuals and what they have faced in life. This happens to be the road that I'm on, but it has really, um, it has really let me know that everybody is on their own path and journey and have their own experiences. They might not be mine, but they're equally as valid. So I've made it a practice to ask more about not how you're doing, but how you're feeling. So I'm just really grateful for the connectedness of people around me. I like this a lot. I think that you've underlined a really important thing in what you've written. Uh, and you've said so much in a short time. But when we ourselves have suffered, it can also make us much more compassionate, much more aware of other people's suffering and situations. And I think so many times we become, should I say, more caring about humanity, about people around us in ways that perhaps we didn't before. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing this. It was really lovely. And I think we'll move on. I just took a look at the time. 
Um, and if we can, I just found Marion, if we're able to. Oh, you found Marion. Can she can. Here. <laughs> I did. This is I can Marion read without echo this time? Hi, everybody. This will be short, I promise. Okay, so nice to see everybody. Okay, I chose what gives me hope. Good. I have faith in the doctors and the scientists who are working on finding treatments that will kill the cancer and prevent it from coming back. I am hopeful by meeting other survivors, meeting survivors of this disease, that I too will be more than a statistic and beat the odds. I am hopeful that through a healthy and positive attitude and nutritional lifestyle, I can increase my immune system to reduce the pain and go forward with treatment. And I also have hopeful that my faith, my faith also gives me hope. Your, your last line again? My faith gives me hope. Yes. Okay, good. Hope is a really important one. It's how we survive many things. And I love that you wrote about this. The doctors, the scientific community, meeting other survivors and yet determined yourself to be one of those, to not be somebody who uh, is taken down by cancer. I'm glad that we got you back, Marion. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much for reading. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead, if I can, and there. There is one thing about writing alone that I do want to mention. You know, I've given you timed exercises, and there's a reason for that. And it's part of Pennebaker's, the researcher I mentioned at the front end, it's part of his model about how expressive writing works and works best. When we free write, when we get started writing, something can happen. And I'll give you an example of something that happened to me many years ago. I was a mother of two daughters and my husband drowned in an unnecessary drowning accident. I had so many confusing emotions all piled in the same place from one day to the next. I didn't know who I was, what I felt or what I was doing. But I wrote, and for a while, it made me feel so much better. I feel pages after pages after pages of what I was feeling, the questions I had, and so on. And then I kept repeating those things because there was no easy answer. And then I started to feel worse, really worse. So I did the obvious thing, actually not. I took my daughters to a therapist. <laughs> And he met with them three or four times and called me and said, Sharon, your children are fine. Your parenting skills are good. They're grieving. Let them grieve. That's normal. And I burst into tears and said, well, then why do I feel so bad? And he said, I think mommy needs to talk. And mommy did for two years. But when we write without time limits, and particularly when we're writing out of suffering and pain, we can easily go down the rabbit hole into what's called rumination. And we replay the same script over and over and over. And we don't find answers when we do that. So if you find that you slip into this, that you start to feel worse when you're writing, then find someone to talk to. Okay, stop writing, find someone to talk to. Okay, that's the only cautionary note about writing alone. So here's the recommended process that comes from the search on expressive writing. To write for healing, the first thing you need to do is have a quiet place, a place where you will not be interrupted. Write for no more than 15 minutes. Set a timer, just like you experienced in these five minute uh, episodes. And when the timer goes off, you stop. And do what you did here. Read, reflect, look it over, underlying phrases, words that stand out, that have more potency. The next day, write again using one of those phrases or words that you underlined. And again, set the timer. Try to write three or four days in a row. That's recommended. And write in the way it is most natural. 
if you write with pen and ink, I do. I love my journals. I love paper. But maybe I'm a bit of a Luddite for uh, people who like to use their computer. Whatever works for you, whatever way is most natural, that's the way you write. Write freely, just as you did here, without stopping. And when your timer goes off, go through that process of reading and reflection. And that's what writing for healing is like. So why write? Well, you know this. You know this from your own suffering, from living with cancer. Why write? There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. It's a wonderful quote from Maya Angelou, the poet. And besides, as Dorothy Allison said about her own writing, she's a writer who wrote a wonderful memoir called Two or Three Things I Know for Sure. And she said, two or three things I know for sure. I am the only one who can tell my story and say what it means. And so my question to you, if you don't tell your story, who will? Okay, let's take time for some questions. Uh, and we do have some time for those. That's great. Thank you, Sharon, so much for sharing all these tips, the prompts and the cautionary note that we can all use while exploring our own expressive writing. I'm hoping we'll see some questions come in the chat um, and the Q&A box rather. Uh, so please, if anyone has some questions, please put them in there. Um, Sharon, I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit about um, your journey, a little bit more about how that expressive writing has really um, helped you to become where you are today. Yeah. Uh, for starters, I was always a reflective kid. I ran around with little yellow spiral bound notebooks and a purple ink pen for years, writing deep thoughts. <laughs> but I like to write. When I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, I wrote just as I did when my husband died. But I also took a couple of creating writing, creative writing workshops uh, from a woman that I'd wanted to study with for a long time. And her way of leading that was to allow, we used prompts, the timed writing was not rigid. There were long periods to write. And we shared out loud, but we did something very different than a lot of creative writing classes. We did not critique. We simply offered a comment about what we liked in another person's writing, what pulled us in, what was strong, what was descriptive, what was beautiful. And that was so freeing to me to get rid of that critic. We all run around with an external critic, and mine's pretty large, to get free of that. And so the next thing that happened is someone put a magazine on my desk. I was managing, uh, I was the interim manager for a breast cancer association, as it turns out. And it was James Pennebaker's research on writing and healing, and all the light bulbs went off. And so we found a new executive director that we wanted to, and then I came back to the organization and said, I'd like to try something. Uh, I'm going to submit a proposal, a 10-week, a little long side, but a 10-week writing workshop for breast cancer patients and survivors. I'll donate my time. Can we do it? And that's where it started, and that was 23 years ago. Now, I still lead groups. I still lead uh, groups for cancer patients through Gildas Club of Toronto. I've led them... Uh, at Stanford University Cancer Center. I've led them uh, at San Diego uh, University of California Cancer Center at nonprofits. I've been to the Omega Institute all over the place working with cancer patients on expressive writing. Now, since I was diagnosed with heart failure, which was a, a sad 
uh, what should I say, side effect from my radiation treatment. Uh, I now lead workshops at Toronto General for cardiac patients. And last spring, I began leading them for organ transplant patients. What have I learned from this? Our stories when we are in grief and suffering, illness, death, longing, our stories of coming to terms with that and discovering new territory, new strength in ourselves are remarkably similar. And we learn so much from this experience. But I must say that the people in my group inspire me more than anything. It's why I've been still doing it 23 years later. Uh, their stories, their courage, uh, the way people gather together when we lose a member in the group, the poetry that I hear. Uh, and it's amazing. And that's how it all started. And I'm still chugging along happily. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sharon. Um, we've had some great comments in the chat about how e the session so far tonight has been super helpful for, for those that have joined us. Um, and we actually had a tip that uh, about an app to use on your computer for writing called Cold Turkey. Um, and you can use a timer on it and it blocks out everything else on your computer so that you don't get distracted. So anybody that prefers to write on a computer, there's an app that you could um, potentially check out. Fantastic. I did want to say that the reason we use prompts in expressive writing, I forgot to mention this, uh, they serve a very important purpose. They trigger memory. They're the door in to something. If you just sit down with a blank page in front of you, it's like, oh, what am I going to write about today? Use a prompt. And you can find prompts almost anywhere. Uh, I have a blog site. You can get to it by uh, writing through cancer.ca. And I publish monthly a thematic essay with writing prompts and suggestions uh, featured in that. And so that's also a source for you to get some ideas. And it's free. It's just there. It exists. So if you're interested in going further, that's also a resource for you. And that was one of the questions in our Q&A, Sharon. So that's fantastic around recommendations for prompts, a good website or books. So now they have an extra resource available there. Yeah. Um, there is a question from Jennifer uh, wondering if there's any research that shows a link between journaling through cancer and better health outcomes. Um, this individual had um, early on in her cancer treatment, so their oncologist said that. Um, but the oncologist wasn't able to share any references. So she wondered if I, you had any There's an excellent one. Uh, Kay Adams, uh, K-A-Y-A-D-A-M-S, has written a book called uh, about therapeutic journaling. She is a counselor uh, and, and works with cancer patients. She's based in Colorado, but I think the book is called uh, I can't see it backwards on my shelf, but The Way of the Journal. But if you go to Amazon, for example, and just look for journal therapy, uh, when you're writing alone, Kay Adams is a great resource. She also uses prompts, but it's more guided uh, for a one-on-one. -on -one. That's great. Thanks, Sharon. And uh, another question is, do you save all of the things you write in when you're doing these workshops? And that you're thinking that it might feel therapeutic to burn um, this influence links. It might be therapeutic to burn theirs. I'm just curious to know what you do with yours. Oh gosh, it, beneath my feet is a bookcase full of journals. <laughs> Does that tell you anything? <laughs> um, I uh, before we moved back to Toronto a few years ago, I had to go out to our garage in California, and I had to slenderized my journals. I had boxes of them. And so I started, but of course it took me a week because I read and read and read everything I'd written. And it brought all it back all of it back. And yet it also I saw the growth, I saw the change, and I felt I probably kept a quarter of them, but the rest I was willing to let go. And I think you just have to get to that place on your own, but they do take up room, <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> and my I still write every morning for an hour and a half or two. Uh, sometimes it's creative, sometimes it's ideas for workshops, sometimes I'm venting. It, but the point, the important thing is I have a practice of writing. And, you know, I've got projects in front of me to write stories for my grandchildren. And one thing leads to another. The more you write, the easier it becomes. But you have to decide, when can I let this go? Absolutely. I, I think we have one other question for you tonight, Sharon, just to, to wrap up our Q&A. And the the question is, what advice do you have for people who are not natural writers or people that are more comfortable with the spoken word? Record yourself, I think. I mean, people come to my workshops, I will tell you this and say, I'm not a writer, but I hear that so many times. And I'll say, well, do what you can, just try. And I give a lot of little short exercises. Every week I give a, a three minute warm up, and it's just called spill it. You know, anything goes on the page. We're not going to share these, we're not going to read them out loud. Just go. How are you feeling today? What's on your mind? You know, did something happen to upset you? Just write it. And maybe you start there. Uh, maybe you start there. And you do the same thing that you do with the prompts. Read it over afterwards. There's usually some gold in them with our hills. And you'll find things in those lines that you can expand upon. But otherwise, get a tape recorder and talk. I did that too uh, during one period because I was doing my doctoral research in, in Guelph and living in Toronto. I, <laughs> I had one of those dictaphone, I'm dating myself dictaphone things that you used in business. And I would dictate uh, as I was driving along, which is stupid, but I was deep into some recovery from some difficult times uh, in relation, trying a new relationship out. And the way I got it out, I dictated. And it worked for me for a while. <laughs> Be resourceful. You can also do, uh, you know, journals that are art therapy journals. I mean, you can do a collage with a little bit of writing uh, and make beautiful things. You can do journals where you find writing of writers that you like, cut it, copy them and cut them out and, and put them in. You can draw in them and cartoon in them and also write in them. Whatever goes, but it's called expressive expressive arts. Try it. And that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Thank you again so much, Sharon, for being here with us tonight and sharing your time, experience, and expertise with us. I also want to do um, a thank you to all those that shared both in voice and in the chat tonight, and for everybody for joining us for our session. Thank you. Thank you to Stephanie and Marianne, and for the help you gave me in the run through, I've gotten a lot better since I was a year ago with this technology, but we're getting there. And I wanted to mention, if you do have questions, or as I mentioned my blog, here's my contact information. Uh, my email, I don't know why I put www. My email is Sharon at SharonGray.ca, easy, and writing through cancer. Ca. Those are resources. I'm a resource. You can ask me questions too. Um, and I've been delighted to, to talk again with all of you as I did last year. Hopefully my slides are better and I'm in better control of SlideShare. But thank you for your attention, for sharing your words, and I wish you all the very, very best.